Welcome back to Cambridge Inside Out. I'm Robert Winters. And I am Patrick Barrett. Patrick Barrett. And wait, what? what are we Stay coffee. <laughs> what is coffee? Um, it's, uh, I think it's a state of mind like Xanadu. A state of mind? Really? Um, like Xanadu. It's uh, an ice Rose cream flavor bud. made with coffee uh, that Toscanini makes coming to a central square near you. Central Square is going to be like the coolest place on the planet. Real going to be now. is is now. It's going to be even more cool. Come see our art gallery at Eight Essex, 8 Essex Street. There we go. So, um, all right. So we we now have a new council, twenty twenty one council, and a school committee. But let's talk about the council and some yep. of the council priorities. Uh, and that goes beyond just council priorities because there are city administrations, community development department, lots of priorities for a lot of a lot of parties in here, right? So what's uh, what's on the horizon? Right. What would you, what might you expect to see as sort of like uh, front and center, um, first in the queue? Well, for all of those fans out there, I know the first thing that they're going to want to know is that the affordable housing overlay is definitely coming back 100% guaranteed. In what form it takes? That's the big question. I don't know. Yeah. We had we had a bunch of amendments, and I think it was but for Craig Kelly's vote against. Um, it would have passed. Um, so the big question is, uh, is whether Patty Nolan is uh, more of the J Debs no vote, and if Jeevan is more of a Craig Kelly no vote. And I don't honestly know the answer to that question. And why? And I think it's you know the thing is that if you are, I mean, I mean I have my own issues about that whole particular issue having to do with my personal revulsion to sort of taking over a <laughs> higher and higher fraction of the city's housing stock and turning into, quote, social ownership. Right. But, um, uh, but it, there's no way that we're not going to have some sort of conversation about this in relatively No, quickly. and, and I'm, 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 I'm actually kind of happy to have the conversation. The, as someone who didn't really speak out uh, for it or against it, I, did, uh, I think it was pretty known to some people who I talked to that I, I wasn't a huge fan of it, but the, uh, the, my bigger issues with the affordable overlay was the, in, the, in the very purpose of the language the city council presented, it was supposed to put housing in areas of the city that doesn't have any housing. And I know, just like every other person who works in real estate knows, that the affordable housing overlay as written would never do that. And if they really wanted to put housing, quote unquote, on Brattle Street or in West Cambridge, then they would draft something that does exactly that. Not an entire overlay for the city that absolutely won't do that. Right. So. And my other issue, my, the second issue on that was I was afraid that if the city council passes something like this, and it actually came up the planning board for the Harvard Square zoning, that once they pass this, every other change in the city will be judged based on this. That somehow, if it, uh, if it somehow unravels the affordable overlay for other kinds of development, then we can't do it. Or that the affordable overlay itself was the answer to our housing problems. It is not, demonstrably not. Even the advocates who knew anything about this knew that that was not the case. Right. It's, uh, I found it interesting. We, last, last time we were together on, the, on this program, we talked a bit about the, the rezoning they were doing in Somerville. Mm -hmm. And Somerville take, took a completely different approach to a lot of these questions, mm -hmm. not only just in the form-based zoning throughout, but in many respects, the zoning that they proposed and passed in Somerville mm -hmm was a lot closer to what in the early going Envision Cambridge talked about before it sort of got hijacked. And, um, you know, I think that there are different paradigms, different ways in which you can actually frame some of these discussions, not only about housing, but about zoning and density and how do you shape neighborhoods and urban planning and all of those things. I think we've sort of head down a lot. We have headed down some of the wrong roads we we head down the we hit down some stupid roads and by and, and by stupid I, I really mean we have places of least resistance some may call them soft soft areas of the city or soft sites in the city um, where development is a natural or development actually can come doesn't really disturb too much what's already going on and in some cases like in Central Square where you know the mil the buildings were demolished and we can simply build them back up again yeah. um, is sort of low hanging fruit and we ought to be focusing on these areas before we take a bulldozer to a neighborhood and if anything I just said sounds radical or crazy or you don't understand it then that's probably why we have we are we are where we are because. This, if you can't, like Somerville will look, took and did the corridors of, of Somerville for the most part, the main thoroughfares for most development. We could do this in Cambridge tomorrow like a light switch and no one would even notice that it happened. 
Um, but no, instead we decided to do the most difficult piece of it, which is basically gut neighborhoods for no reason at all. Yeah, I, I think that it was almost like a sports analogy of last what happened last year too, which is that there were people were choosing sides mm -hmm. and saying, we're gonna win this battle. And at some point, yeah, yeah, there were some changes and amendments, whatever, but it really became more about my side's gonna beat your side. It really came about if, if you yeah. were for the affordable housing overlay, you were awesome. You were progressive, you're like, right. you know, hanging out with Bernie Sanders on a cloud somewhere. And well, actually, you, all these people voted against that, by the way, in case right. you wanted to know. Right. Um, but, but if it, you objected, you, you were evil. Ah, classist, racist, yeah. classist yeah. and, and I, racist. I never bought that, uh, that uh, model of looking at things at oh, all. I, I thought I, it was ridiculous. I, I, I want to just clarify something, because I, I know I triggered a bunch of people who, like the three people who are going to watch this. Um, when I said gut neighborhoods, I really meant that you know, going into a going into these neighborhoods and creating a sort of open-ended zoning pattern is a much less constructive means of, de of developing housing than building along the corridors. No neighborhoods are being gutted by putting triple deckers or four deckers. That's not a thing. Right. Well, you know, the, and uh, again, then we should move on to other topics. But I'll say that one of the chief objections I had to doing this thing as a zoning petition in the way that they did, mm -hmm. basically, they were putting into place a mechanism through which with every passing year, they would simply take more and more and more privately owned housing and put yep. it into the, quote, social ownership category, and that there would be no way to ever get six votes out of nine to ever change that, so that it essentially becomes I'm, a permanent mechanism. I'm gonna say something controversial, and I apologize, but this whole discussion was really kind of gross to me because you have the Affordable Housing Trust, you have the affordable housing developers, they're all kind of the same group, giving each other money, granting each other money. It's a little bit incestuous in terms of how that's done. I think there's a conflict of interest across the board in there, just saying. But that you now have created a vehicle to do this, to the streamline projects, that wouldn't there also now be more impetus to even exact more revenue and more revenue and find new ways to justify taking you know, whether it be transfer tax increases, whether it be any, any, we're getting rid of your residential exemption or any other kind of thing that, they, that can be thought of to generate more funds. And that if the goal, if, if you, this is where like the ideology gets twisted, is like if you are the angels of the affordable housing overlay, anything that goes towards the affordable housing overlay is, is objectively terrific right. for going all else. And I'm, I'm not here to say that that's, you know, you're, that you're bad people, but that, there's a much better way to build housing. They right. get a lot more done a lot quicker and a lot, I, exactly I, how you want to do it. But. Now, I don't, I don't know how much consensus there was for the Somerville zoning. Um, but the thing is... It took a while. But would, what would really be ideal is if, in fact, somehow they could hammer out some sort of compromise where they could actually get nine people to agree. Now, maybe that's too ambitious. Hon but honestly, give me two architects, uh, one real big shot developer, and I could rewrite the entire zoning ordinance for you in eight months for 50 bucks <laughs> and all the ARAMS pizza you can give me. Have you ever had that in East Cambridge? I just had it for the first time. It's yeah. fantastic. Yeah, oh yeah. Um, I never ordered on Grubhub because it says ARAMS number two and I never <laughs> wanted to have number two pizza, but I ordered it the other day. Thank you, Nina Berg and Michael Monastine for teaching me all right. the way. All right, now, other things that I think are, were talk, talked about, you were actually on, there was this uh, yep, the mayor's blue, blue, ribbon. blue ribbon thing about... Much to the chagrin of a certain person in Area 4 with the moniker Area 4, Gerald Bergman, you yeah, yeah. rascal. But now the thing is, is that the thing is, in addition to any type of talk about, you know, subsidized housing or whatever, but there's also the general category of, quote, tenant protections or, yep. you know, uh, prevention of displacement, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, I don't know what... People can talk about stopping gentrification, but that's a process that's going to continue whatever, whatever way. Anyway. I, I don't it, think you want to stop gentrification. You want to stop the negative effects of gentrification, right. which are oftentimes the displacement of people of lesser means. All right. So what are the possible initiatives that may actually be coming down the pike sort of in the first round of this? I can tell you definitely yeah. that we'll be looking at very similar condominium regulations that Somerville recently adopted. Um, the, one of the caveats is we won't have a condo review board like Somerville adopted, thank God, because uh, when I heard that, I screamed and yelled, and like, that's a rent control board in disguise. It's also, you know, 
people who are on the who are on my board in particular, there's a lot of attorneys uh, who represented clients in New York, um, places where there's a little bit more development pressure than say in Cambridge, and you know the idea that landlords um, agitate with intent to agitate tenants with. Uh, improvements, roofs, siding, painting, that kind of thing, in order to get them to move out, um, is the reason why Somerville has this review board that you, if you want to paint your building, once you've already decided that you're going to go condo, you have to get their permission to paint your building, which I think is absolutely that's effing starting to ridiculous. Sound frighteningly like the way the rent control board right. used to work exactly. in Cambridge. So the, and, and, and I remember back even when I was first a city council candidate, when I was focusing on the rent aspect of rent control. And then some, a woman I still remember, she came right up to me very sincerely and says, you don't understand at all, do you? She says, it's not about the rent. It's mm -hmm. about the control. Absolutely. It's the fact that if you wanted to do something with your property and that might actually lead to some higher rent or whatever, but it was just because you wanted to have the flexibility to do something, that you had to get the approval of some city administrative board mm -hmm. before you could even do that. There are already so many ways in which we can cede control of our land to the government. This is a this to me is a step too far. In that, if the government really wants to have my property for public use, then they should pay for it, just like the Constitution says they right. should. Um, in terms of condominium construction, I have already told Sumble and my the group that I was in. I, I actually, it's kind of funny because um, the uh, I think I was like the token evil landlord of the group. Um, that a lot, of, a lot of them were trying to like reverse engineer my mentality towards development. Like, what would I do if, what are the signs of condominium construction? Um, and, you know, in, in Cambridge, unlike Somerville, we can't, I think two families, three families, and four families are going to be exempt from the rule. Right. Um, so right now you're talking Almost about... Almost a political necessity, really, if you're going to get support. So what right. you're talking about is five units and up, and I want you guys right now, we'll pause the show, go look up, any kind of five building, five unit building or more that went condo in the past two decades, you might find one. Um, so you know, like, there was a time when that was the the general pattern because that was the way out of rent control. It was not only not even after rent control. The thing is, is that condominiumization was sort of a good way to sort of go in, grab those formerly rent control buildings, you know, flip them, mm -hmm. condoize them, get out, move on, move to the next project, whatever. It was just something people were doing. But then as rents went up. Holding rental property and taking in rents became actually a better op a better option but, for but a lot of people. But looking at the world a little bit from the top down, you know, I see this as the precursor debate towards the rent control debate. That what these groups are now trying to do is to remove condominium conversion from the equation by increasing the expenses costs for moving people out from I believe it's like six hundred bucks now to ten thousand dollars per per person um, to extending the. Uh, time in which they can stay in the unit from one year to five years, and in some cases up to seven years, which essentially would kill any condominium conversion project. Um, I see condominiums as one of the few ways that people who don't have a million dollars in their bank to be able to actually buy a piece of property in Cambridge. So by removing this from basically the real estate environment, what you're really saying is you want less ownership. Um, that to me is, is not the right message. You know, I... Um I have mixed feelings about this in that I'm problem is you can't turn the clock back. If you could turn the clock back 20 years and uh, uh, do some sort of control of condominium conversions solely for the purpose right. of maintaining a, 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 a significant stock of multifamily, small multifamily properties that were not condominiumized, kind of that would have been the ideal means of preserving middle class uh, presence in the city. Because that was how you did it for a hundred years. Well, you, I, you know, you, you, you had a two family or a three family, it helped support your costs. You could provide affordable housing for other people as well as for yourself. But, you, but the thing is when everything became condominiumized, those opportunities were pretty much lost. So now it's just a matter of, well, you pick up a condominium because you can. And, and yes, it gives you a stake in the game. It and, does. And, and that's a good thing. But if you look but, at the amount of conversions that took place in Cambridge last year, I believe the number is something like between 60 and 70. It's basically the, 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 the blip. The, the, the barn doors have been open far too long. Yeah. All, the, all the horses have run away. It's, it's, uh, it's well past this time. And, 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 the, and the rental market is so much more lucrative. It's, right. No one's transferring. Yeah. No one's converting. I own a 20-unit building down in East Cambridge. I'm never converting that 
to condos. Why would I? Right. The rental market is incredibly strong, especially in a neighborhood like East Cambridge, where only very few properties are built up substantially, and the housing market is severely crunched. Yeah. In 20 years, we went from the condominium share of the housing stock in the city being at the, the, at the bottom of the totem pole. Now it's at the top in terms of number of properties that are condos. Yeah. You know, so that, that whole process has already taken place. But I, I see this as a larger strategy. And I, 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 the people who are pushing this the most, like the guys in Somerville, who are predominantly our revolution, uh, Mike Connolly, you know, people who really just want rent control back at all costs, are just strategically removing all the, the previous sort of uh, loopholes to the old rent control bills. Um, it's sad to see. It's really sad that we're doing it on this kind of, uh, you know, incremental destruction of the housing market kind of way. But, you know, I, I pick and choose my battles, and I, right. I, I'm I'm not fighting this one. But I'm happy to I'm happy to stand with people who want to fight right. it. But I just hope that somehow they discover sort of just reasonable things that you can do, just that are more people centered rather than property centered. Well, about just you know helping out individuals who are in stuck situations so that they are not well that's part of the, that's part of the thing you know Sumbul Siddiqui wants to, I believe will be interested in starting something like a housing of office to, uh, office uh, office of housing stability like uh, Somerville has and where attorneys can volunteer their time to yeah. help people do intervention you I will be the first yeah. attorney in line to absolutely do that. Beating yep. up a landlord is not only easy, it's super fun, it's super enjoyable. I know all the laws and you know, there's, um, you know, I know all the best words, I feel like I almost said. Um, the, uh, it, it's very easy in Massachusetts to protect tenants. There are protections for them, they just don't know what they are and that's right. the problem. And what, and what, the, what she was really trying to do and I think the thing that I, I would even help them try to block is that when someone goes in and buys my 20 unit building or your 20 unit building or whatever, um, and then they buy it to clear it out. That's where the displacement happens. Right. Is that, that moment of transfer. So address that. Address, yeah. thank address you. Address that. Simple. You know, but the, the problem is sometimes people, they, they get a little too large in the way they try and solve problems. It's not sexy to do something that's pragmatic. Yeah. But, you know, honestly, it's the small solutions that are usually the ones that are most lasting and effective. So, um, now, it's not all about housing. The thing is, is the city council will have to address was. a lot of other things. <laughs> a lot of it, is, it still comes down to property and development and whatever. Yeah. You know, there's certainly lots and lots of things to go on. Like, um, uh, so, for example, I mean, they'll still have to, you have uh, the Harvard Square petition. Not that I want to get into too much more of yeah. that now, but that's, uh, that's pending. Yeah, I'm meeting with a few in, folks this expires week. Expires in what, March? Or? Expires in, at the end of March. I'm meeting okay. with uh, CDD tomorrow along with Dennis Carlone. Hi, Dennis. Um, to go over some of the fine details, and we'll probably get that back in the ordinance committee before the month's end. Now, the thing is, there are other parts of the city that probably can, will and should see some sort of modification to the zoning. Central Square. Central Square, I think, maybe could use a little more filling of the gaps, mm -hmm. I think. Um, I've um, definitely felt that as the, you know, let's face it, I think within the, this council term, the new Green Line extension will be completed and operating, right? I uh, bet you a dollar. Bet you a dollar. <laughs> well, at least the Union Square yep. uh, stub end should be, they're, they're building it right now. Yep. I went over to Bridge the other day. I saw they're, they're building it right now. Yep. So the thing is, is, within the next two years, that'll be operational. Now, with that public transit node, when it's operational, there's development pressure, and everybody who owns property around there knows it because they're getting letters every week saying, so, I want to buy the place. So development pressure, but also, like, that is where development should go. Exactly. So and, there should be some kind of um, uh, rethinking hmm? of what do you want. Boynton Yards on the other side of the fence in Somerville is going up to 24 stories. That's going to abut the neighborhoods where, I believe, is it Jackson Place? Um the, the, what's the name of the housing project? Roosevelt one? Towers? Sorry, Roosevelt Towers. Sorry, sorry, right. sorry. Roosevelt Towers and the area where Columbia and Webster intersect and right. go across. Which, is, which is really used to be the, where the junkyards were. Yeah. Right? If you look at it on Google Maps from the top down, it looks like right. uh, you know, basically New Orleans after Katrina. Yeah. Right. Now, there have been some developers who've been basically getting ahead of the curve and mm -hmm. have been doing some projects in and around there. But I think the city needs to take a step back and sometimes the city is just reacts honestly it doesn't think ahead mm -hmm. but i really think the council and this community development department ought to be really thinking hard about that area same thing with leachmere square yeah right because when they move the green line station to the other side of the road and they're going to you know 
capture that where the where the turnaround is on the on the trolley. Right. Um, you know, and it you know coupled with the the Galleria changes, the courthouse redevelopment that's going to happen. These things have people have to be start thinking about this. Well, you and I will disagree a little bit on the degree to which these places should be developed. However, my overarching theme for 2020 is that we all need to grow up a little bit. We all need to spend a hot second just accepting some realities and that either we're going to be part of the solution right now and figure some of these things out for the next 150 years or we're going to fight like cats and dogs. We're going to do nothing. And then all the things that you didn't want to have happen, you didn't want 30-story buildings, you didn't want 40-story buildings, are going to have to happen because you've stopped development. The costs have gone up. The price has gone up, as it steadily has in Central Square and everywhere else. And these are what we'll be faced with. These are the options we'll be faced with. I'd much rather address it head on and then have a solution. And decide the best places to do those sorts of developments. Absolutely. So anyway, so that's something I think the council is going to inevitably have to address. Mm -hmm. uh, sort of, and it's consistent at least with the, not that I have a lot of great strong feelings about the Envision Cambridge process, but the thing is that if it was worth anything at all, then I think this is the time post process planning process where you actually have to start well, implementing some things. I'll, I'll, I'll be the first to tell you that you know Michael Monastim and I have talked extensively about our you know, about plans for Central Square. We got the bid passed. We had zoning passed two years ago to really help existing buildings. And we want to go full court press for the remainder of what C2 is going to bring to Central Square. And even maybe you'd look at the heights again, because it's been seven years. Um, we think that um, it's time. And we rather ha I'd rather have the discussion and up and down vote, or rather have the council look at me and say, no, Patrick, we don't want to build more housing in Central Square, um, then have them not. We have vacant land, we have, you know. The truth is you could probably produce more housing, more affordable housing if you basically think proactively places like Central Square. Had we had all of that controversy from last year. Had we, had we passed it seven years ago, we would have built more affordable housing than the affordable overlay would have built yeah. in 20 years. Yeah. And for all of you, for all you people who fought like tooth and nail to stop that from happening, you would have gotten heights at 14, 14 stories. You're not going to get that the second go around. There's right. no way. Yeah. And Massive Maine already set the precedent. Yeah. So so anyway, so there are those types of things. There are, there's one other part of the city I thought I'd mention a few minutes on uh, to the end is, is that it was actually the first part of the Envision Cambridge process had to do with focusing on the Alewife area. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing is, right now there is a, a petition. I don't know what its fate is going to be that's going to expire in January. They're going to just let it go and redo it, I'm not sure, having to do with this uh, Northwest tri uh, LF Triangle redevelopment. But in it, you remember all the discussion we had about they need to build a bridge over the tracks? Yep. Part of this proposal has a bridge over the tracks in it. I don't know if everybody understands that, but I think is this great thing that everybody wanted could actually happen if they go along with this. Now, mm -hmm. What are, you, what are you paying to get that? I don't know. I don't know. But the thing is, is that I think a lot more people should be paying a lot more attention to this. And it's not completely inconsistent with what the Envision Cambridge Plan was I, pushing. I, I have something so controversial I'd like to say. Go right ahead. I hate development in the life. I think, right. I think it's the worst idea ever. Um, not the worst idea ever. We have plenty of worst ideas. That's an exaggeration. Um, I think when we have all, we talked about soft sites and other places to build in the city. Alewife is the last place I'd look to really develop the city. And what I would say to that is that if all you're going to do is is develop and develop one or two cul-de-sacs into without any interconnection between them as opposed to weaving it into the fa greater fabric of the city, I would I will agree with you completely. If you're a Yimbi, which means you adopted a terrible name for yourself and I'm sorry for you. Um, or Nimbi, the same thing. Um, you know, you, you're essentially sanctioning the development of like mini suburbs within an urban environment. It makes absolutely no planning sense whatsoever. Right. Um, you should be focused entirely, just like Somerville did, on the corridors first. And then, once we built out the corridors, then, you know, uh, let your grandchildren go figure out alewife. Right. But not, not now. So here's, here's something, this is a, I led a walk through Alewife, Alewife down through the Charles River, through Fresh Pond, Mount Auburn Cemetery on Sunday, and um, one of the things I just want to point out, because people talk about a bridge over the tracks, I'm going to, here's my challenge to the city council, don't just go for a bridge over the tracks, go for two bridges over the tracks, and multiple uh, footbridges over the Little River. 
to actually fill out the Alewife yeah. reservation. You're chock full of ideas. I am chock full of ideas. So the thing is, is that, and I, 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 I'm just going to show one Star more quick Wife. graphic Star here. Wife. Yeah, yeah. Starwife. Okay. Now this is actually not from the city of Cambridge. This is actually a little piece from the DCR's Alewife Master Plan for the Alewife Reservation. Now some of this was actually drafted before what's actually uh, put together right now. But the thing is, is that they actually have um, the 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 green areas all redeveloped or available now on the north side of the Little River, on the south side of the river, and there's no connection between them. But I just thought I want to just sort of point out here that in fact it's part of their proposal from the DCR. They have a bridge going across here to interconnect them. Not only that, but they also propose having a bridge much further out here, close to what they call the Silver Maple Forest or whatever, as well as another one over here. I think here. that's where Mike Connolly was born, wasn't it? Um, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But the point, oh, I love the start with. My point is, is simply that if you work diligently with the DCR and say, look, this is your plan and we'd love to see it happen, maybe you can actually get some traction yeah. in there. Furthermore, and I'm not necessarily saying you have to go with the bridge that's proposed as part of this Cabot Cabot Forbes petition, for uh, the quadrangle, or and I should say the triangle. It's actually the quadrangle. If I said triangle, I meant to say quadrangle. Um, but we the thing is, is that if you could do that, there's actually also, um, and I'll see, we'll sort of probably end on this note here, um, the Envision Cambridge process also envisioned another greenway. Actually, this is not really the best graphic of this. Here it is. Right down there. It's like a schoolhouse rock right? traffic. There's like a sort of slashing diagonally through there is actually a greenway that would be going through the quadrangle as well. I w my proposal basically is do that, do the bridge further west, as well as ones closer to the T station. Try and push for them both. And if you're really good, talk with the MBTA people and see about you can actually realize that vision about putting in a, a commuter rail stop there as well. Amen. And have the bridge be part of the commuter rail stop. <laughs> so anyway... There's your challenge, folks. See, Thank you, Tom. See, see you next week on Cambridge Inside Out.